There we go. Hello and welcome to Eight Simple Rules for Making Customers Happy. Hope you're having a great Wednesday morning, afternoon, wherever you are staying warm if you're in a polar vortex part of the country. My name is Wes Yee. I'm the uh, Senior Director of Growth at Guru and I'm joined today by two outstanding speakers, Sarah Sheik, the Head of Customer Success at Front and Hilary Curran, the Head of Customer Experience at Guru. How are you doing? Great. Awesome. So I thought we could get uh, today kicked off just getting to know both of you a little bit. Um, and so I'd like to ask you each to share a couple of fun facts about yourself. Hillary, why don't we start with you? Okay, great. Um, hi, my name is Hillary Kern. Um, I, like Wes said, I'm the head of customer experience at Guru. Um, two fun facts about me. One, I have a fraternal twin sister. Um, her name is Rachel. Um, so if you ever see someone in Chicago that looks like me, it's, it's my sister. <laughs> the colder, and, colder version, probably. Ever, yes, exactly. It's just specifically today. Um, the second <laughs> fun fact is that um, both of us, my sister and I, made it to the final, final callback for a Coen Brothers movie when we were eight years old. Um, and the movie was A Brother Art Thou, which was filmed partly in where I grew up, which is in Arkansas, but we didn't get the part. Uh, we were too old for the part, but anyway. Too old at, at age eight, huh? <laughs> at eight. Yeah, they, they wanted some younger kids, but we were pretty close. There was a singing part involved, which would have been pretty funny. Well, maybe we can get you uh, to sing a little piece of it uh, <laughs> the next time we see each other in person. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Sarah. How about you? Yeah, Hillary, if there are any recordings of your <laughs> um, tryouts, I'd love to see them. Um, uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sarah. I'm head of CS at Front. And uh, my fun facts. So these are very different fun facts. One is um, uh, when I used to work for Microsoft, we had a, an event at SeaTac, the football stadium. And I was wearing a white dress and I was one of few people to actually kick a field goal in my heels um, across, yeah, like on a <laughs> football stadium. Um, wow. I'm proud of that. Um, and then the second one I'm equally as proud of, even though it's much more nerdy, is um, I was at one point in my life president of the Harry Potter Club. I don't oh my know goodness. at what age that was, but um, I was really proud of it. Like we had different teachers, head of the different houses. We had a quitter. Wow. Um, we were all in. <laughs> that is uh, that is fantastic. I have lots of Harry Potter related questions that uh, I'll have to table since this is not the uh, eight simple rules for getting through Hogwarts. Yeah. But, uh, awesome. Awesome. Glad to get that from you guys. I won't steal any thunder, but uh, I have four dogs and um, I was once one of the top 25 Warcraft players in the country. Uh, wow. So I was much much younger and had quicker quicker fingers on the keyboard but uh uh yeah so a little a little gaming trivia there for you <laughs> but uh let's let's keep rolling so our agenda today so we are going to get into the eight simple rules as you would expect um and then we will take all questions through the question and answer feature in in your zoom interface um we'll take all those at the end um so but before we get right into it just a quick some quick background about guru in front and so i will ask hillary to uh, quickly give a little, little, little dive into Guru. Awesome, thanks Wes. Um, so Guru is a software solution that brings the knowledge that customer facing teams need to do their jobs to them when they need it. Um, so what is knowledge? Knowledge is the content that you're gonna send to a prospect or a customer, um, the frequently asked questions that your team asks um, multiple people multiple times a day, any questions around the roadmap or internal tips, all that information can be stored in Guru and surfaced across anywhere that you're working. Um, we also have a deep integration with Front as well as with Slack, um, which allows us to kind of show up wherever you're working. So that's about Guru. Awesome. All right, Sarah. Great. And Front is, yes, it has a deep integration with Guru. Um, and it's a collaborative email app that helps teams work more efficiently together. It brings all your messages, whether it's Facebook, email, SMS, into one inbox, and you can access your customer's data by connecting apps like Salesforce, Asana, Guru. And teams like Shopify, HubSpot, and over 4,000 customers use Front today to manage their customer communications. All right, fantastic, thank you. Okay, let's jump right in. So we, uh, based on hopefully some of the people on this call got the reference to the old TV show, Eight Simple Rules for Dating My Teenage Daughter. Uh, we came up, uh, well, you guys came up with eight rules uh, for great, creating a great customer experience. So let's jump right in with number one, which is speak the customer's language. Yeah, this one can seem like very straightforward, but let's unpack it a little bit. So 
um, you want to communicate the way your customers want to be spoken to. It's super easy to get swept up in terminology you're used to, like whether it's um, being used to being in a tech company or in a startup or whatever industry that you're in. And in our world, like we often use the terms like SaaS, EBRs, QBRs, sprints, CSMs. And your customers may not be or likely are not familiar with these acronyms or this uh, terminology that's so specific to your organization. So a recommendation is like spell out that language or don't even use it if you don't think it's going to resonate for them and get familiar with your customer base um, as much as you can. Get to know your customers by either reading their blogs, keeping up to date on their LinkedIn um, and look at their brands and their even their public facing website and you'll get super familiar to the language that they're using and start to incorporate it into your engagement, how you're communicating. Um, you know, Hillary and I were talking too, like I'm sure that there's ways that you guys are like shifting the way you use um, words to make sure that your customers are like recognizing what you're trying to say. Do you have some examples of those? Yeah, um, one, one particular that, that uh, jumps out at me that I've, I've learned over the past couple of years, we had one, uh, one or two customers who, instead of talking about onboarding, um, maybe internal employees, they use the term speed to green, <laughs> which is a little bit more fun to say, <laughs> and I've actually started to adopt it. Um, so they're always about like, how, how, how quickly can we get someone onboarded? What, what's the speed to green? And so just learning that vernacular and being able to incorporate it into your language when you're talking to the customer, or maybe when you're presenting slides to them about the, the value of your product is just going to make them feel like more at home and a little bit um, more, you know, easily um, part of the conversation. So, mm -hmm. Speeds of green sounds like something that could be used for a lot of different competitions, uh, races <laughs> for money. I can imagine the sales team getting very excited about something like that. So yeah. Yeah. Do you guys have any internal um, language or any sort of like internal lingo that is, you know, very front or very guru specific that, uh, that you could share? Um, internally at Guru, we talk about, um, well, it's also part of our external um, messaging as well, but instead of talking about sales enablement or en enabling people, we talk more about the empowerment of people. Um, so talking about the sales and success and support teams being a revenue empowerment team. So the team that's empowering your, your entire company to obviously, um, you know, increase sales and, and, and drive value to your customers. So that's a little bit of, you know, a change in, in a couple words that has um, allowed us to a little bit more broaden our, our, our reach and also kind of explain what, 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 what we aim to do as, a, as an organization. Cool. Yeah, and on, on an example on our side, that's a little bit more feature specific, but I think you can really translate this to your organization is, mm -hmm. you know, we think about our different features and there's, we now live and breathe and leverage front internally that we often, um, we were very intentional about making sure that that language can then translate to our customers and that we don't forget that like, hey, like even though it's like common verbiage for us, that like the customer understands it. So for example, we have an ability to tag any of the incoming messages so that it helps you organize and have a repository of your information. But tagging doesn't necessarily translate um, across the different customers that we work with. So we find ways to really define and make sure that they, they're also on the same page as us. So it's making sure that you're like checking back in with the customer, but that you're very intentional about the words you're using to label your product internally as well. Great. All right, let's jump into number two, which is embody the champion you want your customer to become. Wow, this is an aspirational one. I love it. Yeah. Um, so I was never a cheerleader in a past life, but I was actually, uh, I used to go to Penn State, and one of the things I was was a moraler, which kind of I think embodies this, but it's basically someone who's supposed to like pep someone up and get them excited. And so um, as part of being a customer facing, or when you have a customer facing role, I think you know, a huge part of your of your job and your and your goal is to get someone excited about your product and to show them the value. And so being able to embody that and be really excited to talk about what your product does and how valuable it can be and the outcomes that are associated with it will sort of um, transcend the, through the call and through those conversations and hopefully, you know, catch on and is a little more contagious. So we just try to make sure that everyone on our team who's engaging with customers is really excited about the product that they're working with and that they can talk to it almost in a way that, you know, um, because we use it internally, we, we use Guru and, and we use a lot of other products, but being able to talk to it and, and really just personally, genuinely talk about the value that you see from it as a, as a, as a human um, can, can really help uh, make those conversations much more genuine. Makes sense. Sarah, how are you guys doing it over there? You know, um, and to echo Hillary, I think she's completely spot on. And 
Um, another like mechanism to do this too with like anyone who's new joining your company is have them go through the customer journey. So for example, when someone is new to our customer facing team, they'll watch the same webinars, they'll read the same help documents and see the different drip campaigns that a customer would go through. And that allows us to constantly reflect and double click into, hey, like, are we providing the right resources, but also builds empathy for everyone here internally as to like, what does our customer go through? Where do they hit certain change management aspects or where are like some sticking points so that we're constantly iterating, but that we're also constantly feeling what our customers are going through very, the very first time. Yeah, that's awesome. And one of the things that I think that we've, we've also tried to do, which I think it kind of um, jumps off of that. And I, I know you guys do this as well, but if you hear anything that's really cool that your customers are doing that may be unique, um, to try to spread that out across the rest of your customers. So for instance, as an example, um, one of our customers made like a funny GIF that talked about like how everyone should use Guru or like, did you Guru that? And it was a really simple idea, but when someone sent it into us, we were able to spread it across to other customers and share it. Um, and it's just like a really small thing that, you know, can kind of uh, spark excitement and joy in, in people. That's awesome that you guys are really thinking about sort of the I feel like the next level is that emotional connection where people do get excited by our product. I mean, we're, we're all, we all use so many different tools and uh, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't find a lot of joy in, in, in some of them. And, and I, I think a lot of that does come from relationships and seeing somebody else who's really taking advantage of that and, and seeing those benefits that you guys are talking about. All right. Rule number three, lead with your core values. This is one that's near and dear to my heart. So, so I'm anxious to hear what you guys have to say about this one. Yeah, of course. You know, so your company likely spent a lot of time constructing its core values and they're important to you when you were probably interviewing for that company. You're like, yes, like I, these resonate with me and I embody them. And here at Front, we really do try to reinforce them both internally, but equally, we want to make sure that we are embodying that with our customers, with our family, with our friends. And just to go over those core values with you, one is transparency. So um, we want to make sure that our communication is open, that we are candid, and that we're also constructive, um, and that we're carrying integrity in every single interaction that we have with our customer base. Um, the second one is care. So we strive to be generous and thoughtful in every interaction too. So it could be as simple as one sentence that you're responding to, or um, as, you know, as deep as an executive business review that you have with st certain stakeholders and you're going into deep content. We want to make sure that you're really providing a level of care along that way. Our third core value is high standards. So we aim for excellence in everything that we do, and we are always striving to go that extra mile. Um, so that could be, you know, from a customer perspective, as simple as like the time in which you do respond and that we are making sure that we are closing the gap and responding to our customers quickly and efficiently, but also it relates to the quality of the outreach and that engagement. And so are we, you know, if we're reaching out and it's maybe even like an outreach to a customer we haven't heard from in a while, how do we provide value in that outreach and not just saying, Hey, we want to just check in, but what can we give the organization that maybe they hadn't seen before or hadn't heard of that we're providing so that they get an aha moment while getting to engage with us and the last core value at front is collaboration um, you know everyone on our team shares in our impact and we're better together because of that and so we recognize that as it pertains to our engineering our product our CS our leadership team but I think this also strongly relates to how we interact with our customers. We are candidly, obviously better off by having their business, but having them be our partners. And we remind ourselves of that often um, because without them, we wouldn't be an organization. And you wanna make sure that you remind yourself of that and you embody that when you're working with them because you're thankful for them being a partner, for wanting to use your product. And that will exude in your communication style and your conversation with your customers. I'm hearing a little bit, uh, I had an old colleague who uh, he always wanted us, everyone in the company to live by the platinum rule. So I think we all know the golden rule, treat each other like you want to be treated. Uh, but for those who don't know the platinum rule, it's treat other people like they want to be treated, which is actually sort of putting yourself in their shoes and thinking about uh, their true needs and, and some of their goals. So um, awesome to hear that. I like that one. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I love that, Wes. Um, so we have, I think, 10 total core values. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but they're all amazing. The two that I wanted to talk about was one called um, we're marathoners, not sprinters, which I think is pretty, um, 
very invocative of, of customer success as a, as a function. Um, you know, we're in it for the long haul. We're going to help someone through impl implementation of the product and, and, and pass that. Um, so just making sure that when you are developing relationships with people, that it's not just kind of, um, I'm only going to be work working with you for this short amount of time, and we're, we're not going to talk again. And so making sure that, you know, you're in it for the long haul. You're there to help them kind of throughout their entire customer journey um, and, and trying to reinforce that throughout your conversations and making sure that you have check-ins and, and um, you know, building that relationship up over, over the course of, you know, what could be several years of a, of a partnership. Um, the other one that I wanted to talk about was um, something that I think is also really relevant is um, we create advocates. And I think it's similar to one of some of the ones that Sarah was talking about, but, um, you know, the customer success is our success. So we want to make sure that the people that we're working with um, and the customers, you know, that we're shining a light on on all of the, the outcomes that, that they've been able to uh, see with our product and that they're becoming advocates for um, not only Guru, but also, you know, just knowledge management in general and, you know, making sure that they can potentially take our product maybe to other companies or s spread the word about it um, because they want their friends and, you know, other people that work in, in similar spaces to, you know, see the value that, that, that they've seen um, and be able to, to, like, kind of have a better day at work because they're using this really cool product. So creating advocates is huge. I love it. Awesome. All right. Rule number four. Don't just manage customer relationships, invest in them. This is another one that uh, as a marketer, I'm always thinking about how customers and prospects and, and people in our ecosystems relationships are with us. Um, and so I know that um, on your right, your guys' side, this is, this is definitely a big focus. Yeah, this one's pretty simple. I think it kind of transcends uh, customer success and support and also goes into sales, right? So whenever you're working with customers, they're also people. And so making sure that you get to know maybe what their hobbies are, where they're from and, and all that, that stuff is going to help you just develop a, a better relationship. It's also going to allow you to tailor your, your working with them, you know, to, to the way that, that, that they're going to potentially receive information better. For instance, we have some customers who like love chatting with us um, in our chat solution. Um, we, we use intercom. And so, you know, being able to understand that and know that, you know, m maybe they're on the road all the time and they want to be able to be in a chat environment versus having calls like that kind of thing and tailoring it and investing in how it's going to be most useful for them. Um, the other sort of example is like I usually take a good amount of time to get to know people um, online before I talk to them. And so you can find out crazy things. Um, I found out once with a customer that she was actually from the same hometown as one of my family members and we like they like grew up next door to each other and had no idea <laughs> and it's just a bizarre coincidence but it was it paid off and you know that relationship is so candid with that person now that I can you know text her or email her and and it just seems so much more genuine than like I never would have known that about her I probably would never have came, come up on the phone so getting to know people from more of a personal level. You know, we get Christmas cards from our customers and when they get promotions, you know, that hopefully they're, they're going to let you know and it's just going to uh, allow you to, to deepen and invest in that relationship over time. Yeah, and then this is just good business, right? I mean, if you think about the way that, you know, the way that you buy anything, whether it's reading reviews or asking your friends about it, like you, you are much more likely to buy something where you get a, a someone who's an advocate who says, hey, I've, I've done this, I've used this, it's awesome, you're going to like it. Like that feels so much better and when, you can build those types of relationships with your customers. I mean, just amazing. Right. Things happen. Yeah. They remember those moments, right? Like it's like you, maybe it's like years from now and they've left mm -hmm. that company in which they were working with your product, but they remember like, Oh, Hillary, like she mentioned that like she worked at like, or lived in the same city as me or something that relates yeah. to them. Like they remember those little moments. Um, but taking one step back too is like, it might be difficult for you to get, um, you know, you already maybe have like this big subset of customers and you're like, cool, I don't know how I'm going to be able to capture all of that information or go back in time and like know all of this stuff about your customers. Or we move accounts often between different stakeholders internally. How do we make sure that we keep that kind of um, fluid transition of information? So I think one thing in like a high volume customer situation, one way that you can make sure that you are transferring that knowledge is, um, make sure that you're capturing it. I think that it, oftentimes we always remember to capture, you know, what's their use case, what's their main challenges, um, you know, are there any like impeding risks that we should be aware of? But I think the great things that Hillary just mentioned, like try it and make sure that you're capturing that information as well. So in that moment, say things like, hey, they have two cats, they have a dog, or like they're really family oriented. And 
it doesn't hurt to make sure that it's being saved in whatever form that you guys save your customer information in, be it your CRM or your customer success tool or platform. And that way it at least lives and continues to live when someone else in your company is taking over that information. Um, and then secondly, uh, you know, in addition, like remember that it's um, what's in it for the customer. Um, I think that it's good to know your customer as much as you can at a personal level. Um, and maybe you don't always get that opportunity, but something that you should also know about your main point of contact is that while they're invested in working with you to make your product successful at their company, they also have personal aspirations. Um, what's next in their career? What are they hoping to achieve? Maybe by implementing your software or your product, it's helping them achieve a specific goal at their company so that they can get that promotion or they can move into leadership or so that they can say that they hit a huge win in that quarter. And the more that you can understand what, what's in it for your customer in the short and the long term, the better that you can help them get there. And they will remember that for honestly, like the rest of their careers. Yeah, this is so smart. And, and even just separate from customer experience philosophically for business or, you know, I, I've, I've, you know, seen people who uh, as part of their hiring, if they're looking to hire someone to be a manager, uh, they'll ask them, you know, tell, tell me, tell me five things about the personal life, about the people that you managed. And if they can't answer that, then, you know, the, the kind of the conclusion that uh, this, this, this author was saying was like, well, then they probably weren't a very good manager because they weren't connecting with the people on their teams. And there are so many ways within the workplace and def certainly customer relationships are, are a good example of that, um, where that's valuable. Totally. Cool. All right. Rule number five, we're, we're at the halfway mark. Share customer feedback with your entire team. Yeah, so let's start with the why. Like why even share that customer feedback with your whole organization? I think one, it brings everyone together. So when you all feel in touch with the impact you have on customers, you stay genuinely united behind that common cause. And then I think number two is that it provides encouragement. It, it, it's a constant reminder to your team internally of the impact that you are making. And it inspires everyone to keep doing um, a stellar job. And so at Front, we, we do this in a number of ways, um, but one specific way is we do have a shared inbox in front. Um, so for like all of our customer NPS surveys or emails to our feedback at um, email and responses to even like on our app from review sites like Google Play, we have them funnel in into front. And that way, anytime, you know, someone submits, um, you know, a survey or sends an email or leaves us a review, we get to see it in one place. And so every teammate at front at any point has the accessibility and the transparency into seeing all of these messages, which I think is super powerful that we're not, you know, holding on to specific information that we share with the company, but anyone can have access to that information. And it's very empowering. And then on top of it, um, our, our leadership really, you know, drinks that champagne or eats that dog food, whatever you prefer, but I like the champagne one, um, is that even our CEO, Mathilde, she will, like, if she finds an MPS survey, whether it's on the positive side or the constructive side, will at mention the whole company and say, like, look, this is one that has really good feedback for us, but I want everyone to see this. And it is so encouraging to know that even our leadership team is so connected to an end user who just recently got on front or someone, an admin that's been on front for a few years and wants the whole company to really um, get behind it. Um, and another way is we also, you know, not just within our product, but we want to make sure that like we're finding ways as a group to talk out loud about our customers is having customer spotlights um, at our all hands. And I think Hillary, you guys do this at Guru as well. Um, it's important that in those, you know, whether you have weekly all hands or monthly all hands, you find an opportunity to you know, bring back the customer story. So sometimes like we'll talk about a, um, a new customer because it's like a completely new um, industry for us, for example, or we'll talk about a sticky situation. Like, hey, like this one had like a rough onboarding, but this is like the things that we did to try and solve for it. Or we even do like customer conversations. So we'll take conversations that our support team has with a customer and share like, hey, like this is ways that we can really interact with our customer um, in a sophisticated manner, or these are better ways to communicate. And we share it with everyone so that we're building, you know, that continuous internal empathy around the customer base. Awesome. Yeah, we do a lot of those things. I think it's super, super important. Um, we try to, you know, constantly tell everyone that this is a customer centric culture and a customer centric product, right? We want to make sure that 
if we're building things or selling a product that everyone's really in tune with what the customer is wanting and saying and, and talking about. And so in order to do that, you have to just keep pushing the feedback and, and, and making it really loudly known by the entire company. Um, some of the ways that we do it at Guru, we have a Slack channel that the entire company is required to be in um, and anyone can post feedback from a customer, a prospect, even a, their own internal feedback in there. And there's been some really cool threads that happen with maybe the CTO or, or maybe someone in sales talking to someone in, you know, uh, maybe more like um, entry level lead, gen lead generation, talking to someone in development. All these, these conversations happen that are sort of across teams and it allows for really cool conversations and sometimes even creates new product ideas or, or um, you know, just information like, hey, we, we should actually follow up with this customer and, and do X, Y, or Z. So that's been really cool to see. Um, also, every time we release a new feature, we have a channel on Slack where um, all of the conversations about that feature are posted. And then we also, um, after that feature has been released, the customer success team will post all the feedback that's specific to that feature in that channel. And that's been really, really cool for our developers and engineering team to see because I think they're really one of the hardest teams to connect to the customer because they're so much behind the screen. And so being able for them to see, you know, oh, like so-and-so at, at Shopify or Spotify, like really likes this feature and it really changed their day. Um, that was worth all the time and all that man hours that I put in trying to get this co com uh, completed. The other software that we use, which I think is kind of worth noting, is called Chorus. There's a bunch of different recording um, software out there, but this allows you to record all the calls that you're having and, and potentially like cut them up into separate, separate segments. And so that's allowed us to share really um, very, you know, from the mouth of the customer, specific feedback about whatever feature it may be, um, where anyone on the team can go back in and actually watch that and see the customer's reaction. And that's really, really been um, sort of revolutionary, I think, for the team here at Guru. One of the things that I heard that Sarah said that kind of raised the question for me is it sounds like both, and obviously working at Guru, I know this about Guru, but also at Front that uh, the leadership team is totally bought in on the value of customer yeah. feedback. Do you have any tips for people who work in organizations where maybe that isn't the case? Any, any suggestions on how they can get their leaders to engage with customer feedback and really see the business value? And this goes to either of you. Yeah, that's it. I mean, I think a part of it is, you know, embody the change, as cheesy as it sounds, embody the change that you want others around you to have. And that does apply both, you know, like bottoms up and top down. And so if you're finding it challenging in your organization where leadership is not being tapped into the customer base, um, I would just you be the person who's like, you know what, hey, like, can I have five minutes in our next all hands, I want to share something or, Hey, like, like, do I have an opportunity to share like a monthly newsletter on our current customer base? You find ways, um, as someone, whoever you are within the organization to take whatever you're seeing within the customer. Like if you have a customer success team, customer support team, or you know, things about the customer and sprinkle it throughout the journey. And I think that you'll be surprised at how people pick it up and how much people will miss it if it ever stops. Um, right. And I will say that like, you know, even a little bit more, maybe not morbidly, but like on the darker side is that if like, you know, like you're, it's going to be hard for the organization to really last and succeed if they are not tapping into the customer base. So it is also like, you know, there's indications of like, those are like yellow flags to me if leadership is not being bought into what's happening at the customer base. And so um, I think that in order to succeed, it's, it's that vital that you should play a hand in some way or um, slowly convince them to, to shift their gears. Yeah, the, the other day. thing I'll say, oh, go ahead. I just said seize the day. That's right. Uh, the only other thing I'll say, and I'm a, a data nerd, um, but I would say, one of the things that I constantly tell um, the customer success and support team here is that if, you, if they start to see trends and feedback, we have people that their main job is to go through and see all those trends, but if you start to notice one or you really feel passionate about one specifically, start tracking it and, you know, whether it's tagging it with something specific or, or you know, just, just keeping an account of how many people are saying the same thing and how often, um, and then taking all that information um, and quantifying it and showing it to the CTO or whoever, that's a little bit more powerful. Um, at least it's been helpful to me. It's, you know, a lot of times you, I can show them multiple examples, but being able to say that these are the numbers and this is the number of people over the past week that have asked about this, um, it, it, it will make your case a, a much more louder, um, you know, in, in, in the long run. Yeah, yeah. To, the, to piggyback off of that, mm -hmm. I'm so glad that you brought that up. One thing that, you know, it, 
you know, it's, it's sometimes a little bit more challenging to implement, but it can be super powerful. And we're doing this here at Front too. is even like, say not so much on the CTO side, but like you're working with like your head of product on product roadmap and you're mm-hmm. super passionate about certain things you're hearing from your customer base. Like to Hillary's point, the more that you can quantify it, the better. And so we're tying it to you know, opportunities for growth or opportunities of like, we will lose like these parts of our business. We don't build X, Y, and Z. And so the more that we can tie it back to like, how do we want to build as a company? What are the next few quarters for us going to look like? And similar to like our previous rule where we're like, speak to the customer as to like, what is important to them? What's in it for them? It's the same thing for your internal stakeholders and your leadership team. Like what is in it for your leadership team? Why would it be important that you want to like empower a specific feature or up, um, upvote a specific um, change in your product? And if you tie it back to revenue, for example, for your um, product leader, that will probably resonate for them more. I love that. Yeah, no, it seems like a real two headed dragon. You add the, the emotional connection of some of those customer stories that you get your team addicted to. And then the, the numbers side to, to bring it back to, uh, to some of the bottom line results that, that are impacted by this. So awesome. Thank you guys. All right. Rule number six, close the loop. So very tightly tied to the previous rule, but uh, you know, certainly customers uh, that are kind enough to give us feedback, we, we, we need to do something with that, right? A thousand percent. No, this is super, super important. And I think, um, you know, it's super easy to say that we close the loop, but um, it's really, you have to do it. And it takes a lot of effort and time um, and it can be costly, but it it will definitely pay off because your customers will be super shocked that you did. (laughs) Um, Because so it's, it's, I think it's hopefully becoming a trend that people do are actually doing this, but um, I think it is rare right now in in a lot of software or just products in general, when you do submit feedback and you hear nothing, it's like cricket. So um, one of the things that we try to do at Guru is anytime you submit an NPS or um, if you're, if you write into our team with a specific question or an insight or an idea, um, if we, you know, first of all, responding, first off, whether we have an answer or not, but giving them some sort of response. And then we log all that information and we categorize it by name and company and what the specific feature was that that may be tied to it. And then if we ever release anything or maybe that's something that's tangentially connected to that, that would would affect that person's feedback, we make sure that we tell them about it and that they are, um, you know, aware. And so it's been really cool to see that the the, the responses to that saying like, oh my gosh, I kind of forgot I even told you guys about this. And so glad that you, that you reached out. This is really cool. I'll be able to, you know, engage more people on my team now. Like that kind of stuff totally, you know, will, will, will make it worth the effort. Awesome. Yeah. Like I think one piece of, cause all, all of that, like I would, I would a hundred percent echo. And just to emphasize from, you know, Hillary's response is that like she mentioned it, like an answer is better than no answer. Like sometimes we might be like, oh, like we just don't have it. So we'd rather just, you know, maybe like just let it go. And like the customer will probably forget or maybe they won't, but maybe most of the time if it's like a small feedback that they provided or commentary that they gave, but it's up to us as stakeholders and representatives of our organization to provide an answer. And it could be as simple as like, look, like the honest thing is, is that it's actually not a part of, um, our 2019 roadmap. It's just not where we're growing as an organization, but I just wanted to let you know. That really does go a long way. And it gives your customer faith that you are, then when you are providing other insight or answers, they know that they can trust the information that you're providing them. Yeah, this really feels like an area where companies can differentiate from others. I mean, there are so many uh, you know, e-commerce experiences that we have where you just get an automated response and, and that's, you know, that's probably the best you can hope for is you get your problem solved by a robot somewhere. Um, but in this case, uh, companies that are, are doing it well can sort of give people that, hey, you're, you're our only customer feel and we're gonna do everything that we can to take care of you. Mm-hmm. Thousand percent. No, this is my favorite rule, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. Well, we have two more, so let's not, uh, let's not pick one just yet. So rule number seven, think strategically about the customer's future. Yeah, right. so I um, uh, I love this one. So maybe this one's my favorite. One. <laughs> um, so there is a reason that um, you know, for those of you on this call, that you are part of the support, the success, the implementation team. You're there to be the strategic stakeholder, um, primed to guide your customers. So remember that, and and then for to do that, in order to be that extra lens um, for the organization is 
stay on top of trends, um, uh, thought leadership, have resources continuously ready. And it may sound daunting. I, I kind of realize that. Um, but anticipate as much as you can the future needs of your customer. And while it sounds like a big task, I'd break it up. So for example, um, you know that customers of a certain size, so say like in your mid-market size and maybe of a specific industry, oftentimes face the same challenges in their first 30, 60 days. Um, and so you can then make sure that say in your, either your drips or in your kickoff sessions that you have with the customers, that you're primed with knowing that information and your steps ahead of the game. So you can say, hey, you know what, customers of, you know, 100 person um, size and in the tech industry, they often always want like a communication plan ahead of time. So we've actually created a template for you. And these are some edits that you can do. We, you don't need to do it right now. Like I think you have like a next two weeks to really like build it out. But we wanted to make sure that you had access to this really rich content. And that way you're like a step ahead because of the information and knowledge that I'm sure you guys have based on the customers that you have now, based on historical customers. And that's what we mean by really thinking ahead and knowing that you have content that you can provide for those customers. That's yeah. awesome. Works really well with uh, some of the previous rules that you were talking about, because I think so much of what you said there, uh, traditionally, you would only know if you had the experience working with customers of different sizes and, and going through some of those challenges. But if you're in an organization that's sharing feedback, that's sharing stories and anecdotes like that, and storing that knowledge institutionally and making it available to everyone on the team, then you can actually, you know, grow and learn much faster and be that much more um, effective with, uh, with your customers. A thousand percent. One thing that we try to do um, that I thought was super simple when I started at Guru, um, it, it, it's, it's a similar thing that the chair is talking about, but just providing like a, a an onboarding deck for like, like here's some Google, a, a, a Google slide template for like a breakdown of our product and, and how to explain it to someone who's never seen it before. Um, I know that, you know, oftentimes when you're on a sales call, they'll have these or a customer success call, they'll walk you through it, but just sharing that with the customer and allowing them to use that in like a train the trainer session. Um, I spent hours and hours before I worked here, like building out these decks and screenshotting things from a company's website and trying to make it look really professional. And so doing that um, is, it's a huge, like really quick win that you could easily do for customers um, and making it really easily for them to access uh, is a, you know, a super simple thing that would really like save someone hours of time and be like wow they actually thought through this um which is super great i love that and like you don't have to also like wait for say the first time that you meet with a customer this could even be brought into the pre-sales process right like between you know here i was talking to hillary yesterday like we have a lot of content we've got uh, new user mm -hmm. checklists or, um, hey, here's like different templates that you can use when introducing this tool to your organization. But feel free to like provide some of this information to customers, um, either publicly or for your sales team so that they can okay. access this information and start seeding it to the customer so that they feel the energy and the excitement of knowing like, hey, like when I do get to work and partner with your, um, with your product, I know that I'm going to be treated really well and that like, I'm going to have content that's going to make me successful in rolling it out. Awesome. Cool. All right. Rule number eight, be outcome oriented. This is one I hear all the time around, uh, around our office. Hillary. Yeah. So one of our goals for 2019 um, was to master the art of the outcome as a company. Um, and that's something that I think we've seen as we've, as we've grown as a company and, and as our product has expanded, but really making sure that you, that you spend time to focus on necessarily just on what the product and, and what, what your software can do for someone, but what outcomes are you actually going to try to aim for? Um, and this is a lot of work to do as a, as a customer success manager, as someone on support, or even a sales team saying, okay, you know, these are the four or five goals that your team has this year that are related to, you know, our, our solution. And this is how I'm going to help you make sure that those things are accomplished. Um, and checking in with them and making sure that they're, that they're tracking those metrics is super, super helpful. Um, again, this kind of ties back to the other rule of, around making, you know, kind of helping them, um, you know, potentially get promoted. Like if, if they can show the value that they've brought to the team, whether it's increasing the ramp time, right, the speed to green, uh, you know, decreasing the number of tickets that they have to answer, maybe because they like have a help center now or, or um, increasing the, you know, the, the time it takes um, for a, a person to, or decreasing the time it takes a person to close a deal. All of those little, all of those um, small metrics, if you add them together and show the, you know, 
after I rolled out X solution, this is what the change was. It's super powerful and they can take that to their manager or whoever and get more buy-in potentially to renew with your product or to even expand it across the company into another team. And so it's been a huge effort on, on across the customer success team and, and even the sales team to make sure that our customers know when they, before they even buy the product, like this is something that we're going to help you show throughout your journey, um, you know, when you're working with our team. Right. Yeah. I, and, I, and I love that. And I think a theme around it too, for like continuing that is just stay curious um, you know, you're asking your customers about those goals, say in the pre-sales process or during the kickoffs, but ensure that you are asking those goals, what their goals are throughout their journey. Yeah. Um, like when they get started, af even after onboarding, like oftentimes like a customer might have specific goals that they had at the beginning that might shift a little after they've seen like, whoa, these are the other things that your product can do. I've now changed my goals or made them more aspirational because I feel like your product can solve all of that for me. Um, mm -hmm. But then also like make sure that you're asking goals when like your specific stakeholders or um, um, the person who had bought that solution no longer works at that organization. Reset what is the goal then of the new person coming in that's taking over that relationship. Um, or if you have a really you know, large book of accounts and you don't have weekly check-ins or you don't have you know, set quarterly business reviews, um, another way to do this for like a really large pool of say like some of your smaller clients is um, periodically do and I know a lot of you might be like survey averse but something that has worked for us is send out a one question survey of like hey like what is your um, you know big goal for leveraging front in 2019 and maybe you have a pick list or maybe you keep it open ended but do these kinds of things so that you are kind of continuously understanding what's important for your customer. And it can be as simple as doing it in a session or as, um, or as complex as doing it in a session and as simple as doing it in a survey. Thousand percent. Yeah, surveys are, are underrated. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I think one of the things that, um, as I've been listening to you guys go through these eight rules is that's really come through is the value of being thoughtful and, and enabling your teams to do that at scale, I think is one of the challenges. I mean, um, you know, certainly Guru and Front are, are tools that can help with that, but I'd just be curious as far as like some of the systems and processes that you've each set up for your teams. How do you, how do you make that possible for people who, you know, they, there is a volume, they're, they're, they're busy, they've got lots of stuff going on. How can they be thoughtful uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and, and not lose their minds? I think, um, you know, well, one, we like, you know, like we meditate. No, I'm just kidding. But, <laughs> um, I'm sure some individuals do. Is, mm. uh, I think it comes down to prioritization. So um, what will help you keep your sanity is think about the things that you know you need to focus on. So while you can't call every single one of your customers every single week, if you can at least enter into the week knowing, you know what, like I know based off of either data or off of, you know, whatever internal tool you use to kind of segment your book, what are the things that you want to focus on for that week? Is it like, hey, like 10% of these accounts because I'm seeing that their usage is a little bit low on specific features. And then I'm going to also focus on these few accounts who've just been like, as of the last two weeks, really actively using our platform, I want to make sure that I'm getting in front of it and understanding like what's going on, like how are you growing? And that way at least it takes the overwhelming aspect at least slightly off the table because you are acknowledging to the, to the ether that you can't do it all every single day. But if you feel confident that you're focused on the right things going into the week and are leveraging whatever, you know, it's different data for different companies, it's different tools to manage that data at different companies, but it kind of take that philosophy and apply it and use your tools for that at least allows everything feel like it's like bite-sized and it helps you kind of um, chew what you're trying to accomplish. A thousand percent. Um, I would say, you know, even from a, a more like drilled in perspective, if you have a strategic account, um, maybe that, that you want to constantly be thoughtful for, right? Um, one of the things that we try to do at Guru is make sure that the entire team of people that may be engaging with that customer is in constant communication and that they're tracking all that information. And so we have channels in Slack, or we also have, obviously we use a CRM, but tr logging all those conversations and making sure that everyone on the team is aware of kind of who's talking to who and what the conversation is about has caused us to see some really cool interactions happen. And we're like, oh, I didn't know that, like you were going to this event, actually, like Sarah from Front will be there. You should meet up with her. And the small things like that that just can encourage people to get to know each other and, um, you know, be more thoughtful around um, engaging with the company as, as, as humans and as people. Um, that's been really cool to see kind of 
it does, it's hard to scale, right? When you have a, a ton of customers, but if you can do it for the big ones that you, that, you know, or, or, or even a prospect that you're trying to land, um, just trying to be really thoughtful about the people that you're putting in front of them and the messaging and making sure that it's, it's cohesive and it's not just coming at them from all different angles and um, that can really pay off. Yeah. All right. Awesome. So we've gone through the eight rules and I'm just going to pause here to just remind everyone that if you have questions, please send them through in the, the question and answer feature in the Zoom. We will take those at the end. Uh, but we have reached uh, our, at least our, our subtotal here at the end. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, hopefully you found a great deal of value in this. I know I enjoyed this conversation. Um, I'm going to click forward with Hillary and Sarah's um, contact information. So uh, you can find them on LinkedIn and of course, um, on both the Guru and the Front website. I'll pause there to, so that you can take in the, the cute little header from our brand and brand marketing team. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I, I don't think anyone has beepers anymore. <laughs> yeah, unless they're on Grey's Anatomy. Um, <laughs> and uh, and we, will, we will be sending out the recording. I think I mentioned that earlier, but, uh, but definitely we'll get that out um, in your hands. I uh, also want to say before we get into uh, Q&A, um, we are offering everyone on this webinar a 25% discount on Empower, which is our uh, conference for revenue generating teams. Uh, so support, success, customer experience, uh, also sales and sales enablement leaders, and, and, and even some marketing and HR folks. Um, so it's in Philadelphia in May. Check it out. Um, the code right here. Uh, and it's, uh, you can check it out at empower.getguru.com. All right. It'll be really and fun. And everyone can come see Philly, where I am. <laughs> you can come see Philly. I'll be wearing a purple tuxedo. It's going to be a great time. Uh, oh, wow. You know, look forward It'll to, warmer, to seeing right? What's that? It'll be a little bit warmer, right? It'll That's be a little, little bit warmer. No polar vortex in May. So I think, uh, I think we should be okay to, to go outside um, that week. Definitely. All right. Well, then without further ado, let's get into some open questions. So, um, and here's an interesting one. So when you, this person looking at customers as more of an account than just a contact. So uh, I think this one came up as we were looking at the investing in uh, relationships. Mm -hmm. And so how do you do that? Or how do you um, en enable your teams, empower your teams to do that for accounts with multiple contacts, uh, maybe new stakeholders coming in? What are some of the ways that you guys address those issues? Yeah, I think that this one is, um, in my entire career, always like a challenging question. Yeah. Because sometimes you don't even know if you, especially if you're managing a really big book of accounts, you don't always know when these changes are happening. It's not that they alert every single product that your company's invested in. Um, so we try our best to monitor you know, tools like LinkedIn to see like when there are big changes that are happening at the executive level and then immediately interact because we have multiple stakeholders with the ones that we are still connected to and say, Hey, like, why did this change? Like, how can we engage with a new leader that's been brought on board? Um, I think another thing is kind of going back to an initial conversation around continuity of information, like, you know, making sure that even before the deal closes that you're getting a broad sleuth of information about the account. And that includes, you know, not just the person that you're interacting with who bought the solution, but like, who else is there? Like, are there any other stakeholders? Is there anyone that we should be like aware of that might be like, you know, opposed to this product um, and start building out that kind of hierarchy. Um, sometimes I like to allude, I'm not sure there's any like wire fans uh, out there. Um, but I always think about like when they're like targeting like a, um, you know, one of the people that they're trying, one of the criminals and they're like, okay, like, connected to who and they're connected to this and there's like right. this matrix going on. And not to say that our customers are criminals, but <laughs> that matrix and see how you can apply that and think, really understand the different elements of your organization. Yes, it's harder at volume. I totally empathize with that, but think mm -hmm. about the really high value customers and start to build out that map. That was a Yeah, I was gonna customers say- customers to Azkaban? <laughs> what, what'd you say? Oh. Sorry, I had to get another Harry Potter joke in and it just- <laughs> That was um, no, I was gonna say we actually try to do this exact thing. Um, there's actually a lot of tools online you can use that, like you can build out legitimate like org charts of companies. But um, for, from a customer success standpoint, um, you know, if you're if you're as soon as you've you, you've had your first conversation with the you know the champion that's going to be implementing your product, one of the first things that we try to do is understand like who is their boss's boss because you know 
obviously we're trying to make this a really valuable solution for them. And if they want to show the value to that person, like what do they care about? Because if, if they only care about one number, well, that's the number that we want to target, right? So making sure that you really understand um, the people who are going to be, you know, the bot, making the, the, the larger decisions, even if they may be, you know, a couple, a couple tiers up the line, um, just having a broader understanding of who that person is um, and, and their relationship with your champion is, is very, very helpful. Awesome. So our next question, um, this person wrote a very, very kind and very, very long note for us. Uh, <laughs> so I'll paraphrase most of it. Um, and so it, it kind of wraps up at the end by saying, what is the best way to manage the Passover to a new team member post-sale in a way that doesn't bring unease to a new client? So salesperson has the relationship. Now they yeah. need to transfer it over to a success person, to a customer experience person. Um, how do you handle that smoothly? And then before you answer that, they also included a PS. We moved to front two years ago and it's been revolutionary with the applause emojis. Yay. So, uh, make sure I pass that on. To you. That's awesome. Um, internally at Guru, um, so there's, uh, there's a couple of handouts, right? One, I think between sales and CS, which is super important. Um, we try to make sure that that conversation, specifically if it's a high value account, um, is happening even before the sales has been made and that that customer success person is being involved maybe in, in discussions around like how hard is it going to be for them to implement? Like what is, what is implementation going to look like for a customer of this size and scale? Um, and that way, when they do make that handoff, they already potentially know the people they're working with. They've had conversations, they've been on calls, or they've listened to them that, um, you know, post um, actually the call being taking place. The other handoff, which I think is super important, and we kind of noted this earlier, is when you maybe have a champion change at a customer or maybe internally you get promoted or someone changes to a different role and you're changing from one CSM to another CSM, making sure that handoff doesn't cause like a stir within the customer. Um, because, you know, you're, you are developing a really great relationship with someone and to be like, sorry, I'm leaving. Now you get to meet so-and-so. It's, it's a kind of an awkward conversation. Um, one thing that we try to do at Guru is make a pretty simple template and make that conversation, one, in person, number one, if we can make that happen, because it's way better in person. Two is to try to get them, the customer to know about the um, about this, this new person who's going to be um, in, engaging in managing their account on a personal level. So in the template where you're in the email where you're sending to introduce them, you know, giving facts about the person, just like we did at the beginning of this, of this webinar, you know, interesting things about them as a human and things that like, they've done maybe in their past life, all that information is just going to make them feel like, Oh, okay. I, I can work with Matt. Like he seems cool. He used to be in an improv troupe. Like that's awesome. And so having those sort of little things can just make it a little bit more of a, of a human interaction and not necessarily like, okay, moving on to the next one. So that's helped us. Um, and I think from the sales to CS, just trying to get engaged as early as possible um, and including CS people on those calls, not necessarily too early, right? But um, when it seems like they maybe need to be involved in the conversation, just helps make that transition um, super smooth. I absolutely love that. I've never thought to think and include like the fun facts about people in those handoffs. Like that's, mm -hmm. hey, like any front team who's watching, like we are totally going <laughs> to that. Yeah. <laughs> So think about your fun facts now. Um, yeah. And just one thing to add is like also be like super explicit about what their handoffs are going to look like for when they're going to be um, using right. your product. So for example, like enable your sales team to communicate what that customer's journey is going to look like when, even when they're just a lead. It's so like, hey, like, you know, if you, do, if you join Front, you're going to first work with like uh, possibly an implementation manager and you'll still have a CSM engaged with you, but your implementation manager is like really focused on those first 30, 60 days. And then your CSM will really own the relationship going forward. At least they like are primed and ready right. for well, like your company has thought about this. There's a reason that there's specific people a part of the different phases of your journey. And by acknowledging it early, there aren't really surprises then um, when, they're, when they are a customer. Now, of course, there, there's the different handoffs that might happen the fact as well. But to Hillary's point, like as long as you're finding, you know, thoughtful ways to make that handoff, whether it's in person, on the phone, a video, there are ways that you can do it at scale too. Um, and then another piece, if you guys are smaller startups, um, you can take advantage of this. And because I really do think like it hits home here is that like if like, hey, I'm taking over an account for Hillary, and I'm like, hey, like I'm the new CSM, um, but Hillary sits right behind me. She just joined the product team, but we're literally on the same floor. She's 10 feet away from me. Like you can use some of those aspects and take advantage of the fact that you're a smaller community and you really are able to share information really quickly. Right. No, that's, I love that. 
That's awesome. Yeah, I, I oftentimes think, uh, you know, working in tech, I try to draw parallels between like tech business and more traditional like brick and mortar businesses. And what you're talking about when it comes to setting expectations kind of makes, made me think of, uh, you know, the experience of going into like a Home Depot. And if you just imagine going into Home Depot, if there were no signs and there were no people in the orange aprons there to help you, that would be the, I had no expectations coming in here and I have no way to operate in this store. I cannot find anything on my own. I will probably never come back. Versus you go there and you know that everything is going to be well, well organized. You know who, you know, that there'll be someone there to help you. And I feel like that's sort of um, uh, aligned yeah. in some ways to the experience that you guys are talking about setting the expectation for. Love it. All right. Our next question. Um, this is an interesting one. What do you guys do to keep company morale up when things are busy um, around the office? Uh, so I think, uh, you know, I've seen some different things where people put stuff up on the walls, they put stuff on whiteboards like you have there, Sarah. Uh, so just maybe a couple tidbits on, uh, on ways to keep morale up, um, you know, when people are dealing with difficult, difficult customers or just uh, struggling, struggling in general. Yeah. I think number one is, um, and I think, you know, like this is not something that just sits within your CS team. I think it's like across the organization of like, how do you maintain and upkeep morale? But I think one thing that's also very near and dear to like my philosophy too is there, we don't sugarcoat, like we're not trying to hide anything. And I think just like, if there is a downtime in the organization, like acknowledge it. I think that's very natural. And you've hired the people on your team or at your company because you know that they can handle the truth and that they want the truth. And so I think it's good to be very direct and transparent of like, hey, like these are the reasons that some of our customers are complaining or that they're leaving right now. And you know what, like we're, maybe we don't have a solution yet, but we know that we acknowledge that this is happening and here is our plan. Yes, there are obviously things that you can do that are like more fun and you keep people enabled and you still highlight like some positive aspects because of course there are customers that are still probably leveraging your product and happy. But I think first and foremost is just you know, like acknowledge the elephant in the room and that there is a plan to remove that elephant. Right. No, I love it. Um, one of the things that we do, um, and I, I think this is really important if you have um, a, any sort of manager or, or, or someone who, you know, is your direct report, um, to sort of shine a light on people when they do, when they are like working really, really hard and make sure the rest of the team knows that and that they've accomplished like this amazing thing. Um, and so, you know, our sales team has, um, has always historically a guru kind of um, posted um, across the entire team, you know, in Slack and all these things of every time they, they close a big deal and it's like very well um, received and everyone can comment and sort of say congrats. And so um, moving into the customer success space, like there wasn't really a place for us to say like, hey, we just rolled out to thousands of users. It was a huge effort and it took a lot of time, like, hey, over here. So we started to do that as well. So now we have a, a win notifications uh, for customer success and for support team. And so they can post those, the entire company can see that. And then we pretty much go into really specific detail, like what it took to do all these things. Like people had to, you know, had to communicate across different teams and there were several different calls and there was these things created by marketing and all this stuff happened. And it's sort of like rallying the team and saying like, we know that you worked really hard for two weeks, but like now it's, you know, it's done and everyone can hear about it. And, you know, you can do a, a whole meeting if you want to talk about all the things you learned, but just sort of having a space to even share that something was accomplished is, is sort of the first step. And I think it's super easy to do. Um, and as long as everyone on the team is on board and takes that channel or that space, you know, um, whatever it may be online or, or even if it's at a town hall and just making sure that it's pretty, it's pretty serious and that people take it seriously take it seriously, um, it, it, you know, it, it can go a long way. That's awesome. Okay, so we are coming up on the, the top of the hour. We have a number of questions that um, I think are just gonna go unanswered, but they'll go unanswered today, but we will follow up um, with a blog post or directly in, if it's uh, something specific um, mm -hmm. after this webinar. So rest assured if you're sending stuff in and we aren't able to get to it now, we will get to it um, at some point. Uh, so I wanted to close with one question um, and, and that is, what is the absolute top metric for your team? So I think, uh, you know, we're all, sounds like very goal oriented people. So wh what are you guys driving your teams to and, and what are they, uh, what are you held accountable for? You want me to go first? So um, at Guru, the number one thing for our for customer facing team is adoption of our product. 
And so we want to make sure that people are actually using the solution, no matter how hard you, you can pitch it and have one person or two people using it, maybe that are champions. You want to have the entire team that's actually, um, that you know, that the, those champions have rolled out the product to actually engaging with it and finding value. And so adoption is, is really like the easiest metric for us to sort of say, okay, 60% of this company is, is, you know, that has access to this is actually using it. That's like a huge metric. It's super easy and it's quickly, um, it's, it's a very good deterrent, de determination of whether someone maybe needs, um, you know, a little more love or maybe a nudge or two. Um, it's like a, a really simple metric that we, we've tracked for a long time. Awesome. Yeah. And I think that just to echo that, like we do that and we look at like different elements of our yeah. products. So like what is their usage score overall, but mainly like even we know there are critical features that right. those customers are successful. So we're like, like hyper analyzing those different sections and saying like, oh, they dropped off in this specific feature or, hey, they're really actively using that. And then from a holistic perspective, what Hillary mentioned, I mean, like, we're just looking like, what's our weekly active users across this customer? Like, are they not only on the platform, but how often are they engaging with it? Correct, yeah. Fantastic. All right, well, Hillary and Sarah, thank you so much. This was a great hour. I hope uh, all of our audience got uh, as much value out of it as I did. And I will look forward to a sequel with Hillary and her sister singing something for us. <laughs> while uh, Sarah recites uh, some of her favorite spells. <laughs> thousand percent. Thank you guys so much. It was great to, great to share a conversation with you, Sarah and Wes. You guys are great. Yeah, thanks for everyone for joining. Awesome. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Stay warm.